And uh, happy Mother's Day to all who are moms out there. <clears throat> Since I don't want to mess up this tech any more than I already have this morning, I will ask you all to mute yourselves. And uh, we're going to hear a little um, voice tell us it's being recorded so we can get the study Recording recorded. Started. There we go. Isn't she pleasant? Well, good morning. We are back in John chapter 1. Now, thus far... We have studied the first 28 verses, or read through and studied them. And, and up until this point, John has written some mystical and historical things, and both are true. It's uh, kind of spooky to start in the Gospel of John sometimes, because we like the history and the narrative and the events, and just reading stuff that's pretty normal. But John got right out of the box telling us that Jesus is called the Word of God, that he was made flesh and lived on earth among men, which we believe as Christians. And stated clearly that the word of God, who is Jesus, is God. He then writes about Jesus having a special kind of a life within him. And to the natural mind, they'd be reading this. Of course Jesus had life in him. Sherlock, uh, he was alive. But John was referring to something far greater. The Greek word translated life in the earlier parts of this gospel is zoe. Like zoology. It's the root for zoology. It means the life principle. It's not the Greek word bios, where we get biology, which is merely biological life. The life John was talking about, that Jesus had, is pure eternal life. That's what we're all looking for. And John goes on to teach that that life in Jesus was also light. And here's that mystical thing he gets into. What does that mean? Well, it's like those old cartoons when... A light bulb goes off all of a sudden over somebody's head and they get it. The light in Jesus has the same effect, but of course it has to do with spiritual things and not intellectual knowledge. And anyone can have this spiritually alive light, regardless of their station in life, their level of education, regardless of their language, culture, race, gender, mental or physical health. It doesn't matter um, what's happened to them in the past, whatever they've suffered. Or what they've done in the past to others. What they've caused in the way of suffering. And John adds that this light of Jesus shines present tense, by the way. He writes this 90 years almost. He's 90 some odd years old. Jesus has been gone for, in his life, 70 years. Even at that time, it was present tense. The light of Christ shines in the darkness. Which, of course, refers to the spiritual darkness in our world. And then John starts to write to us about John the Baptist. The Baptist was unusual even in the first century because of his devotion to God. It was from his heart, not hypocritical. And because he was a religious figure, the religious leaders of the Jews had an obligation to investigate him. We read about that last week. They needed to be sure he wasn't leading Jewish people away from their faith. And so they asked John questions. Uh, was he the Elijah? Was he that prophet? And ultimately, John told them, I'm not the guy you really want to know who I am. I'm not the Messiah. And John answered honestly. He was not any of those yet to come, even in our day, men. They're still prophetically in the future. He was merely a voice crying in the wilderness, making straight the way, you know, make the straight the way of the Lord. It's a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 40. And the religious leaders who were asking him these questions they had to have their hearts stimulated a little bit. He's talking to them with words they knew. He was of the priestly line. His dad was a priest. John's birth was foretold when John's dad was in the temple worshiping the Lord and serving in his priestly duties. Well, John adds, as he speaks to these Pharisees last week, we read it, that there was already a person living among them whom the Pharisees didn't even know existed. And this person was far more important than John himself. And that's where we pick up. So let's take a look at John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. And I'll read it here. In, today I'm reading King James. The next day, John sees Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, 
and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water the same said unto me, Upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw, and I bear record, that this is the Son of God. And that's where we will read today. The very next day, verse 29, after John had that conversation with the Pharisees, <clears throat> Jesus came to the location where he was baptizing, there in Bethabara beyond Jordan. And this was after John had baptized Jesus, and after the 40 days of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. That's already in the past. John's gospel doesn't record that detail. We learn that in the gospels of Matthew and Mark. And behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. There goes Jesus. John points to him and said, there he is. This is the guy we've been waiting for. Now, I don't know which Bible version you're reading, but the word sin is singular. And yes, our individual sins are forgiven if we repent and accept Jesus as the one who paid for them, as the Savior, the Messiah. <clears throat> but the entire world has a sin problem. Singular. Sin causes death. There was no death before Adam and Eve sinned. The scriptures are clear. We'll get that in the epistles. Jesus died for the sin problem of the entire world as well as for our you know, individual sins. But then we come to this phrase, the Lamb of God. We who are believers who have been around the church, whatever church, for any length of time, understand that Jesus is the Lamb of God. But here we have something that leaps off the page at us. It's called the principle of first mention. Now, of course, that doesn't say that, but let me explain. Since the Bible is God's word, it's important that Christians understand its message and the details that God has revealed to us. And I say that because frequently we get in discussions with people from other faiths or even within our own faith at different branches of Christianity and things are said that are not always accurate to God's word. This is just basically a misunderstanding in most cases. And in order for us to understand clearly the message of God's word to us, we have to learn how to read scripture correctly. And I'm not saying this is difficult. It's not. It's just that many believers haven't been taught some basic principles about how to read God's word. And this has led to verses being taken out of context and, and to many weird and incorrect theologies because of simply misunderstanding some basic things about God's word. It's easy to see some of the more obvious misunderstandings of scripture, especially today where in social media and in the press um, and just with the invention of being able to communicate in big ways all across the world the fact that we can even do this face to face and and my mouth to your ears if you're on a phone it's easy to see that those who use the bible to support abortion or slavery or racism and other clearly stated sins have made big errors in understanding scripture the scripture does not support those things but it, it's more difficult to spot delicate theological errors made by people who are true Christians, but who lack the knowledge of basic principles that guide us when reading God's word. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that there are deeper truths in the scripture that only the very learned can know that you have to be a priest or a minister or things like that. It's not what I'm saying at all. It's quite the opposite. I am saying that with a basic understanding of the structure of the Bible, any person can easily understand things of great importance. Now, I say any person, I mean any born-again person, because the Spirit of God will teach you. But it's also intellectually pretty simple. In science, we have underlying principles in each discipline, and that's why there's some debate with this COVID thing going on. Should we wear masks that are effective? Shouldn't we wear masks that are not effective? Which drugs are the best course of treatment? There's just a lot that basic science, based on principles they already know, um, they're having these debates. If a scientist does not adhere to principles that are already known and understood when doing his or her research, and then publishes a, pl a paper which details their research, other scientists, their peers who know the underlying principles, will reject their research. The research is faulty because it isn't based on known principles of science. In reading the Bible, 
to get to our point, the principle of first mention is one of those bits of knowledge that help us better understand God's word to mankind. So let me explain it. The principle of first mention says that when an important biblical word or concept occurs for the first time in the Bible, usually in the book of Genesis, where most things start, of course, that first mention is usually the simplest and clearest presentation of what God wants us to understand about that word or concept. Now, some of the words <clears throat> and concepts are more deeply developed as we study them through Scripture, as we build upon building blocks, but it is the first mention which gives us the essential picture. A less wordy definition that I read is this, and I quote, God indicates in the first mention of a subject the main idea with which that subject stands connected in the mind of God. End quote. For today, the first mention we're speaking of is the word lamb, L-A-M-B. Now the first time in the Bible where the word lamb is found is when Abraham was on Mount Moriah willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. That's in Genesis chapter 22. And the word lamb is found in verse 7 in that chapter. As they were carrying the wood <clears throat> excuse me, and fire for the offering, Isaac asked, where is the lamb? Come on, Dad, where is he? We've got everything here, but where's the lamb? And, and Abraham answered, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. But then they didn't sacrifice a lamb. They saw a ram tangled in a bush and sacrificed it. Now, it's kind of an odd oddity that the word lamb hadn't been mentioned in the Bible for 22 chapters. Because that was an agrarian time in human history. And when we include all the animals we associate in our minds with Adam and Eve in the account of creation, the first time that the word lamb is used in the Old Testament is all the way in the 22nd chapter of Genesis when Isaac asked that question. That's kind of strange to me. Now, since a ram was sacrificed in Isaac's place and not a lamb, did Abraham lie? He said God will provide himself a lamb. He did not say God will provide for himself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb, meaning that God would provide himself as the sacrificial lamb. Now remember our definition of the principle of first mention, that God indicates in the first mention of the subject the main idea with which that subject stands connected in the mind of God. The innocent lamb is connected in God's mind, and he wants it connected in our minds, it's connected as the substitutionary sacrifice for the life of a man. In the case of Genesis, it was Isaac. In the context of our text that we're reading today, remember, Abraham never answered Isaac's question. He never said, there's a lamb. He never answered the question. He, Isaac said, where is the lamb? Abraham didn't answer. But John the Baptist did answer. Isaac said, where is the lamb? John says, Behold the Lamb. Now, adding to the intrigue of this, just so you know, I'm not off on some weird, wild tangent. <clears throat> the first time that the word Lamb is used in the New Testament is right here in this verse. You can th read through each of the three Gospels, and they come before John's Gospel in order, and you won't find the word Lamb used at all. And that's amazing when you consider that all three of those Gospel writers knew that Jesus was the Lamb of God, and wrote of his substitutionary death on the cross, that they wrote about his life within the confines of the nation of Israel. He never really went far. And that that culture in that religion, because of the influence, they were sacrificing lambs all the time, but they've never in the first three Gospels mentioned the word lamb. Look it up. Check me out. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And this happened the day after John the... Baptist met the delegation from Jerusalem. Evidently, John's interaction with the priests and Levites occurred in the presence of others because John adds, This is he of whom I said after me comes a man which is preferred before me. The delegation had left that day. They'd gone back home and told their bosses, who had sent them to get info on John, that he's not the Messiah. He claims he's not the Messiah. So we're not going to have any political uprisings here going to cause trouble for the people. And here John on the next day says, Behold the Lamb of God. Now to you and me, 
in our spiritual Christianity, that's cool, understandable, we get it, we get the principle. <clears throat> but what kind of an impact would that statement have had on the Jewish people who heard John say it? The questions they asked John, um, at least that the religious leaders asked John the day before, betrayed their hearts. They asked him if he was Elijah, and are you that prophet? But they didn't ask him if he was Messiah. He told them. He offered that information. Now, why didn't they ask him if he was the Messiah? That was really what they wanted to know. Was John claiming to be the Messiah so they wouldn't have trouble? I mean, the, the religious leaders knew that Messiah would baptize for the repentance of sins. Last week, we read verse 25. They said, why are you baptizing if you're not Messiah? So they knew that Messiah would do something like this. But they didn't ask him. And it was under these circumstances that John <clears throat> announced Messiah as the Lamb of God. He'd already, John the Baptist did not announce or present Jesus as the Word of God, nor as the Messiah of God, um, or as a great moral example, or a great teacher of holiness and love. He proclaimed Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now God used John to present Jesus to Israel in the very office and character in which they stood in the deepest need, as do we. Remember, the innocent lamb is connected in God's mind as the substitutionary sacrifice for the life of man. And the Jewish people were very familiar with lambs being used as sacrifices for sin. They knew the history of how the blood of lambs sprinkled on the doorposts and lentils of their ancestors' home in Egypt was a sign for the angel of death to pass over those homes. That was the first Passover. And growing up, they'd seen many lambs killed as a covering for sins. And now Jesus is being pointed to them as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. To the Jewish mind of the first century, their only frame of reference for a man being sacrificed in their history would have been the story of Abraham preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac. Their minds, and these were learned, they were the common people, but they were learned in their scriptures. They were, when you hear some of the conversations that even the apostles who were fishermen had <clears throat> with Jesus and some of the people and the religious leaders, they understood what the Old Testament scriptures said. They knew it. Their minds would have been drawn back to that story of Abraham and Isaac. Now remember the principle of first mention. So because of John's preaching and baptizing, we would logically expect the priests and Levites to ask about sin and repentance when they were there, but they didn't because the religious leaders didn't want a savior, even though they knew the prophecies regarding the Messiah's sacrifice. As Jews, their scriptures, the Old Testament, that's their Bible. The religious leaders knew that sin cannot be taken away without sacrifice. We read in the New Testament about Without the remission of, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 in the Old Testament said, It is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. They understood that. And they knew that Isaiah the prophet wrote this of Adonai Jehovah, saying in Isaiah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 37, 23, I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. I will save them out of the, their dwelling places wherein they have sinned. I myself, God says to them. They would have welcomed Messiah on the throne. They wanted him to get rid of the Romans, but they must first accept him on the altar. And they didn't. But it's no different today. The world accepts Jesus as an Elijah who was uh, maybe a social reformer, that's tolerable. And Jesus is a prophet or a great teacher of ethics is great. People love and respect that. But the world needs him first and foremost as the Lamb of God, which is offered for the sacrifice of our sins. And if they don't, they're totally lost. In verse 30, it says this. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Well, Jesus pre-existed John. Even John, um, who was Jesus' cousin and six months older, understood who Jesus was. The Jewish Talmud says, Everything that a servant will do for his master, a scholar 
will do for his teacher, except the menial task of loosening his sandal thong. John, earlier in this record, said, I'm not even worthy to unlatch his sandals. This was a priest, a guy from the priestly line, saying that the day before to the religious leaders who understood the Talmud and had this saying in their minds, that a scholar would not unloose the sandal thong of his own teacher. And John here is saying, the guy who's coming that you guys don't recognize, I'm not even worthy to be a slave to unloosen his sandal thong. John had a right view of his relationship as a sinful human being in the presence of Almighty and perfect God. That's humility. And then in verse 31, he says, I didn't know him, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. This is the guy I was telling you guys about. He's here. And the whole reason for my ministry was to make him known to Israel. Now, why would John have to tell Israel about Jesus? Just point to him and let it go. Why, why couldn't Jesus just show up? Because in the first century, the, the Jewish nation and the people were looking for a Messiah who would get them out from under the yoke of bondage to earthly governments. And at the time of Jesus, it was Rome. Yet the scriptures are clear. They tell us that God himself would come to save the Jewish people from their sins. We just read that in Ezekiel. This was Messiah's main mission. Not releasing us from the bondage of governments or bad health or any of the other things, the financial distresses, bad relationships. It's to deal with our sin. Not just the sin of Israel, of course, but everybody's sin, the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And because national Israel, including their religious leaders, were looking for a Messiah who would alleviate political and earthly problems, they weren't looking for someone who was a nobody by their religious or cultural standards to step up and be Messiah. They weren't, the religious leaders weren't crazy about John the Baptist. But he was religious and of the priestly line and wasn't turning people away from the Jewish faith, so they tolerated him at this point. The people accepted John on many levels, although he told them that they must repent and be baptized, a very in-your-face kind of ministry. At least he was a common man like they were, and they could hear that from him. He didn't lay any heavy burdens like religious works they had to do on the backs of the people, and the people appreciated that. And yet his words spoke to their hearts. They knew they were sinners, just like we know we are sinners. And he was a straight talker. People liked that. I don't know about you, but when I came to Jesus, one of the first things that spoke loudly to me was the straight talk I heard from a pulpit. I was tired of the massages I heard in the Catholic Church. Oh, I heard some of the gospel message and some portions that were read of Scripture. But I heard a lot of stuff that was fluff, and it didn't speak to my heart. This guy, John, was a straight talker. And the people liked that his straight talk to the corrupt religious leaders was... Uh, directed there because those religious leaders did put burdens on their backs. And John the Baptist was a rough guy. He wasn't mean-spirited. He was just a guy toughened by living in the wilderness in his dedicated life to God. And his words spoke straight to men's hearts. And, and one could easily in the first century, if we were Jewish, believe that a man of his straight talk and toughness could be the Messiah. But he said clearly, I'm not the guy. So John made clear that his ministry was to point people to God's choice for the Messiah, a choice people would probably not make using their own intellect. And Jesus was just the normal man on the outside, so John had to point him out. The religious leaders wouldn't have considered Jesus as Messiah. To them, Jesus was just a country boy, a hick from Galilee. That was up in the northern parts, the true burbs by comparison to Jerusalem. And at this point in his ministry, to the people around him, he was just the son of Joseph the carpenter and his wife Mary. Just one of at least seven children. In fact, the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew give us the names of his brothers and sisters. These are, again, things that in the scriptures we should know. And in uh, the Gospel of Mark, and I'm going to read this to you. And I probably have the... Um, Mark chapter 6, verse 3. You guys have to turn there if you have Bibles. Follow along with me. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. 
Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joses and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended because this normal guy was preaching to them. Four brothers, James, Joses, Judah, and Simon, and sisters, plural. So there were at least six other kids in the family. That's not, by the way, that does not negate the virgin birth. Jesus was the firstborn, and he was born of a virgin. That he had brothers and sisters after that makes a whole lot of sense. God is not cruel. He wouldn't have had Joseph marry his beloved Mary and then not have relations with her. That's one of the reasons we have marriage. But anyway, this is what the Jesus who they knew before his ministry got cooking with the first miracle at the wedding of Cana. Back in John's Gospel in verses 32 and 33, John is still speaking. Now understand John the Baptist is the one speaking through 29, verses 29 through 34. And in verse 32, he says, and John, John bear record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Who sent John? God sent John. Verse 6 tells us, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, it seems pretty obvious. We're reading it. Just on a whim, yesterday or the day before, I did a research on what do Christians understand about John the Baptist. And so I typed in the question, who sent John the Baptist? And I can't believe the number of answers that were out there. And many of them were not. God. God sent John. It's very simple. The Gospels, the, the Bible is meant to be read and understood, and it's pretty simply understood in most cases. God communicated to John that the Messiah would be a man upon whom the Holy Spirit would descend in the form of a dove. And not only descend upon Jesus or the Messiah, but he would re the dove, this Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, would remain on that man. It is that man, the Messiah, who would baptize people with the Holy Ghost. Now, look at the wording here. Because words are important. Jesus told us in the Gospels that not one jot or tittle of God's word, that is the smallest bits of punctuation, would disappear from the word of God until all is fulfilled. So the words themselves are bigger than the punctuation, and they're important. It says in verse 32 that the Spirit descended from heaven like a dove and abode upon him, and it remain, was remaining on him in verse 33. The word abode means to remain in place, not to depart, to dwell. In literally, it means to be ever-present. That's an interesting choice of Greek words that the Holy Spirit inspired John the Apostle to write. Let me, under, let me, let me explain a little weird thought I did have this week. Um... And I am just conjecturing here. Understand that. I'm saying that straight up. There is a spirit realm. I'm not conjecturing about this. And things happen that we do not understand. I'm not conjecturing about that. We often do not see what's going on in the spirit realm that affects us here in the material realm. And I'm not conjecturing about that. You read the Gospel of Daniel, chapter 10. Daniel fasts for 21 days. And in verse 2 of the, the book of Daniel, of chapter 10, it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. They had seven-day weeks like us. And at the end of the three weeks, on the 21st day, he has a vision of a heavenly messenger that gives him a great prophecy that lasts for a couple of chapters. And that messenger says to him in verses 12, and 13, Daniel, fear not, for from the first day that you, sent, you set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I am come for your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Daniel started to pray. This messenger was sent immediately. 
but couldn't get there for 21 days. Now, Daniel felt compelled in his spirit to, to fast for 21 days. He didn't know it was going to be 21 days, I don't think, when he started. And I'm sure he didn't know what was going on in the spirit realm, or the angel, the messenger, would not have had to explain it. What I'm saying is that his earthly behavior, his fasting, prayer, was having an effect in the spirit world, and it was unbeknownst to him until the angel told him. I bring that up in the context of our gospel, because John was told, John the Baptist, to look for the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon a man. Now, I wonder if when John was given that instruction by God, was it audible? That is, could the, the people in the spirit realm have heard it, like the angels that hang around God's throne, or even the fallen angels, their spirits, Satan particularly, who has in the past had access to God's throne? I don't know. But it just, as I'm, this is where I'm conjecturing, I, I just don't know. And I wonder if that was one reason why this Greek word for abode was chosen. I say that because we know that Satan can imitate miracles. Remember the contest between Moses and Pharaoh's two magicians, Jannies and Jambres. They could do everything but produce life. Now John was sent and told to look for a man upon whom the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove would stay and remain. Not a man upon whom a dove might simply descend on his head or shoulder for a few seconds or a few minutes or even sit on his shoulder like a pirate's parrot and then take off. This is where I conjecture. I wonder if Satan attempted to mimic this by making doves alight on different men at times in John's ministry just to mess with John's head in an attempt to foil God's plan. That's where I'm speculating. I don't know. I'm just thinking. The point is, there are some spiritual truths here in our scriptures that we need to not just slough off. We have to pay attention that the words chosen mean something. I'm not sure that's exactly why that happened. In this case, I'm just conjecturing, like I said. But the spirit world is real, just like our sin is real. Hence, we know that we need a Savior. And this, as John goes on, he tells us that the messenger, this, this man upon whom the Holy Spirit would descend like a dove, would baptize with the Holy Ghost. He would be the baptizer. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, we have a messianic message, a messianic passage, I should say. And I'm going to read that in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And it's important because this was the scripture, the Bible, if you will, of the Jewish people as it was in the first century, so it is today. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch, capital B, shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. John is saying the Spirit is going to fall on this man. John was a priest. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. This is not the only one. Read Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, and Isaiah chapter 61, the first two verses. They're also messianic passages. To the learned mind of the first century, the religious leaders would certainly have had to think about these verses, if not right away at a later date. If they heard John say, and I'm sure it was reported back to them if they did not hear it in person, that this man who is coming will have the Holy Ghost descend upon him. And then John flat out says it in verse 34, And I saw and I bear record that this is the Son of God. I saw past tense. That's why we know Jesus was baptized at a date before this day that is recorded. And John the Baptist clearly says, This is the Son of God. Now remember, John's, John the Apostle's goal in writing the Gospel was that his readers would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. He says it in this Gospel, chapter 20, verse 31. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. John the Baptist speaking here clearly says that's exactly what I saw, and I testify on record that Jesus is the Son of God. 
He's making a strong statement as a witness in a trial, like we talked about prior studies. Now, why did he say that? Why did he say that Jesus is the Son of God to a bunch of Jewish people? Today, you know and I know that the Jews do not believe that. The, the question arises when John the Baptist is saying this to Jewish people, it rises in my mind, did the Jews of Jesus' day believe that Messiah would be God's son? Well, turn to Psalm chapter 2 and we'll take a look. Psalm chapter 2, <clears throat> it's a very short psalm, but we're not going to look at it all. We're going to look at the first two verses and then explain a couple of things. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And then it lists all these things that these the earthly rulers plan against God. This psalm speaks of the nations of the world plotting against God and God's anointed. With what is written here in Psalm 2, as well as in later Jewish commentaries, later from the time the psalm was written, it is understood that this refers to the Messiah. The word anointed here is the Hebrew Mashiach, Messiah. It's the same word used in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, when he talks about the Messiah will come and be executed for a capital crime. In verse 7 of this psalm, God specifically calls the anointed his son. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again in verse 12, Kiss the son lest he be angry, and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. How blessed that is to all of us. Now if you were to talk to a rabbi today, they would say, this is not the Messiah. They claim that this is speaking of one of the many anointed ones that their God used throughout the history of the Jewish nation. But this is not the Messiah of Israel. However, this is, causes them a problem because ancient rabbinical literature on Psalm 2 tells us that this is applied to the Messiah. The Babylonian Talmud tells us that. In fact, the Jewish Midrash tells us that, which is older than the time of Christ. The Midrash is an ancient commentary on the Hebrew Scriptures. Let me quote something from there. And I quote, The sufferings are divided into three parts, one for David and the fathers, one for our own generation, and one for the King Messiah. The suffering for the King Messiah? That should ring a bell with you and I. And this is what is written, it goes on, he was wounded for our transgressions. Hmm. We know that from the prophets. And when the hour comes, says the Holy One, blessed be he to them, I must create the Messiah, a new creation, even as it is said, and it quotes Psalm 2, verse 7, this day have I begotten you, end quote. That's amazing. That should send chills up our spines. It's a, it makes me excited to know that even the Old Testament rabbis, they lived in Old Testament times, who wrote commentaries, believed that this had, psalm had to do with Messiah and that Messiah would suffer. The writer of this particular commentary declares that the Gentile nations would, and I quote, crucify the son of the king of Psalm 2. The king of Psalm 2 is God, they say. And the son of the king in the context is a clear reference to the Messiah. And this comes from a rabbi who wrote in the Midrash. That's amazing. The Babylonian Talmud, which was compiled 500 years after Jesus, when you would think no Jewish rabbi would believe that the Messiah would have any you know, um, reference in, verse, in Psalm 2. It applies Psalm 2 specifically to the Messiah. In fact, it talks about the wars that's yet to come between Gog and Magog that we read about in, in, uh, in Ezekiel. And this is what that rabbi says, and I quote, against God and his Messiah. It says, why are the nations in an uproar and why do the people mutter in vain? He's speaking of Messiah. 
a rabbi making commentary 500 years after the time of Christ. It's amazing. Then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were found accidentally by an Arab shepherd boy who was chasing his goat. Now, there's no accidents in the spirit world, but from the earthly perspective, he threw a rock, it broke something, he investigated the breaking sound, found the broken clay pots, and found the scrolls. And you know God had that set up. And when that area was dug up by archaeologists, they found that that settlement had been inhabited from about 130 years before Jesus till about 40 years after his death. And the people who lived there, the Essenes as they are known, the area is called Qumran, they were known as religious end-time zealots by some and as mainstream Jews from the first century by others. And they wrote extensively about the Messiah. So because of the time frame in which they lived, if the Messiah was believed to be the Son of God by Jews of that time frame, then we shouldn't be surprised if we found that belief expressed in their writings. And sure enough, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were published um, overall in the 1990s, although they were found many years before, one of those Dead Sea Scrolls is named the Son of God Scroll. Because this is what it says, and I quote, He shall be called the Son of the God. They will call him the Son of the Most High. He will judge the earth in righteousness, and every nation will bow down to him. With God's help, he will make war, and God will give all the peoples into his power. End quote. So in all of those things, that little history lesson is to show us that at the time of John the Baptist and Jesus, and before that time, at least some religious Jews, and probably more than we can imagine, believed that Messiah would be the Son of God. So what's in all this for us today? I mean, we live in 2020. Well, we looked at the principle of first mention as it regards the use of the word lamb and how it relates to the substitutionary sacrifice for mankind's sin. That was in Genesis chapter 22. But there's an other instance of first mention in Genesis 22. We see the word worship happen in chapter 22 of Genesis long before it happened uh, or is stated anywhere in the Bible. Now, worship happened before Genesis 22, but the word is not mentioned. And the first time it's used is in verse 5 of Genesis 22. And in that worship, we see it involved making a sacrifice to God, which tells us that worship does not necessarily mean we have to be singing in church. Things we do as we sacrifice things in our life, lay down our lives for God is worship. That's good. That's good to know. But there's another thing, another first mention principle of first mention in Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 14, as Abraham answers Isaac, he says, after he mentions that the Lord God himself will provide himself a lamb, he says, in the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen. And we learn early in Genesis 22 that Abraham had traveled to the land of Moriah for the sake of sacrificing his son Isaac, and he was heartbroken. Typically, sacrifices are made at the top of the highest point in the land, on a hill, on a mountain. As we continue our studies through the Bible, we find that Mount Moriah is where Solomon built the temple. It was a mountain. It was the biggest, tallest place in the area of Moriah. We call it the Temple Mount today. That was where Abraham took Isaac. The Temple of Solomon was built on Moriah. But Solomon's temple was not built at the peak. He built it down the side a little bit. It was a little bit more level ground. It's the same area where the Lord appeared to David and where David prepared the threshing floor of Ornan. That's a whole other study that's very amazing prophetically also, but we'll go on. So what does this have to do with our text today? Well, by the time of Jesus, the Romans had built roads all over the Roman Empire. They were famous for it. When they built one of the roads surrounding Jerusalem at that time, it they tunneled through the mountain, not a tunnel, but like just hogged out a piece of the mountain to make the road because it was the best uh, engineering plan at the time. And it cut the highest point of Mount Moriah off from the rest of the mountain. And if you were to look at a picture of Israel today from a distance, Jerusalem specifically, you will see this 
hot, you'll see the city of Jerusalem, the old city, and then a little further to, depending on your angle, right or left, you'll see a higher point. And if you look at the bedrock, as you follow the flow of the bedrock, you see they all used to be joined together. The highest peak was separated from what we know as the old city of Jerusalem today with the wall around it. And between them is the road that the Romans had built. Of course, it's been modernized. But the quarrying that the Romans did to dig out that road, which left that smaller peak, left that peak looking like a skull. Now, I say that because it's deteriorated. In fact, a few years ago, it crumbled and the skull face is no longer visible. But it was, I saw it. I was there in the 80s and I got to see it. Plenty of pictures of it. Remember that Jesus was crucified on Golgotha, the place of the skull. That was the highest peak of Mount Moriah. There's a garden tomb just down the hill, down the slope from where we believe Jesus was crucified. And that's where Jesus was buried, in the garden tomb. Interestingly, the place where Jesus was crucified is the same place where Abraham took on the same hill that Abraham took Isaac to be sacrificed. In the mountain of the Lord, it shall be seen. The principle of first mention, something we need to keep in mind as we read through the scriptures and something that might just bless our hearts as we do. Let's pray. Father, what a, what a blessing your word is and what it has for us. It's just amazing. I pray that you would help us to understand clearly the simplicity your word has, not get caught up in the minutia, but to understand the overall message that Jesus came and died for our sins and rose again from the dead. And whoever we are and whatever we've done, if we will just accept that and repent, we too can be heaven bound. Thank you for what you've done and what you've given us. Please help us to be like John. People who will testify to what we know to be true. Those of us who are born again, Lord, whose spirits have been turned around, whose lives are completely different because of the living Savior who saved us and filled us with the Holy Spirit, who baptized us with your Spirit, Lord. Help us to tell them, boldly as John did, what we know to be true, to testify, to be witnesses. Even if we're just like John in the sense of voices crying in the wilderness, not to puff our own selves up, but to get the word out so others too can know the joy of having their sins forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, and we cry.